And joining us now, the journalist and author, Linda McQuig, the author most recently of The Trouble with Billionaires. Welcome back. Nice to have you here. Always great to be here, and Steve. And I should mention your co-author, yes. Neil Brooks, as well, who's... Uh, Tax professor at Osgoode Hall Law School. Yes, and has been on this program before, and a, a, a real uh, rabble-rouser like you, uh, which absolutely. is a good thing. Which is a good I thing. learned so many tricks from him. I'll bet. Here we go. Let me read an excerpt from the book, and then we'll go from there. Buildings on the campus of the University of Toronto bear the names of some notable Canadians, including literary giant Northrop Fry, public health pioneer John Fitzgerald, and inventor Sir Sanford Fleming. But the edifices named in honor of distinguished individuals typically date back more than three decades. In recent years, campus buildings and auditoriums have been named almost exclusively after people whose distinctive characteristic is the possession of lots of money. Okay, so begs the obvious first question, what happened 30 years ago when suddenly we stopped naming it after people who quote unquote deserved it and now name it after people who've got the money? Yeah, well it wasn't really suddenly, but what happened over time, and particularly after 1980, what happens is we, we lower taxes, particularly on the upper income people. And as a result of that, we all know we have less revenue. And we've been, as a result of that, there's been less funding for our major institutions, including our universities. So with that less funding, we've, you know, universities have been obliged to turn increasingly to rich donors to support them. And so uh, in order to entice those rich donors, one of the things they do is name buildings after these people, which is very popular. Okay, let me follow up on one thing right there, because you said governments are taking in less revenue and therefore there's, there's less funding available. I mean, that's not really true, right? They're taking in more money. Well, well. <clears throat> but you're saying not keeping up with inflation yeah, or demand? Yeah, and, is that and, the idea? and uh, inflation, the growth of the economy, the growth of the population. As a here, let, let me put it this way. In, back in the early 70s, uh, universities uh, only relied on uh, uh, private benefactors for about 3% of their funding. Now it's up to 11%. So that what's happened is, as Universe, as, as public funding has kind of shrunk, they've relied more proportionately on, on the rich on to, to bail them out. Yeah. Okay, and we'll explore what the implications of that are in just a second. But, it, I mean, you've pointed it out. Hospitals and universities seem to be particular targets for these kinds of donations. Mm -hmm. How come? Well, because, for one thing, uh, wealthy people seem to like their names on those kind of buildings. I mean, partly because those are very prominent buildings. They're buildings that are you know, treated with great importance. We all see them. Uh, wh what's interesting is that if you look at philanthropy, what you find is that the rich give very little to things that go to the poor. So for instance, like uh, community centers or swimming pools in poor parts of town, you don't see a lot of those named after wealthy, you know, titans of industry. Uh, maybe it's partly because they don't go into those parts of towns. The people they know don't go into those parts of towns. They want to be, seems that they want to be named where they're going to see their name and their friends and associates will see their names. Well, there might be some self-interest as well. I mean, if you're, if you're 75 and you've given a lot of money away and you're worried that you're going to have a heart attack, it's not a bad idea to give some money to a cardiac unit, I guess. Well, that's, that, I, I suppose you could make that argument too. <laughs> okay. um, but if you're 75, why are you interested in funding universities? Perhaps? I mean, let, let's put it Maybe this Maybe for way. your grandchildren. There's no doubt, uh, certainly, people give money because they want to help important institutions. Hospitals are important. Uh, you know, but but, but I, I, I think it is important to point out that a lot of the money that was given in philanthropy uh, ends up in things like concert halls and places where symphonies happen, universities, which are all important institutions, but they tend to be, that tends to be the priorities and the interests of the well-to-do elite. Okay, let's go to the University of Toronto, just a few subway stops south of here, where you pointed out $120 million was donated by wealthy alumni and benefactors in just the past five years. Well, no, it's $120 million a year, A year, actually. Yeah. For over five yeah, years. Yeah. What's wrong with that? Well, it's, the question isn't what's wrong with that. The question is, is that the best way for us to be funding our universities? For instance, what we used to do was we used to have higher taxes, particularly on the upper income people, and so we would get money through the tax system and fund our universities that way. Now you might say, what's the difference? Well, what, well the difference is that if we, if we collect money through the tax system and use that to fund our institutions, 
we have democratic control over what's spent with, what, what's done with that yeah, money. Yeah, but you're you're hearkening back, I think, to a time that never was. Because I remember even in the even in the glory days of William Davis, when you know education was a very was yeah. I guess uh, you know getting a bigger chunk of the budget than it is right now. I remember students demonstrating at Queens Park saying, you know what, we're tenth out of ten in provinces in terms of per capita funding well, per student. Of course, so it was ever thus. Th it was ever thus that students always want more. I, I remember those days too. At the same time, it is absolutely true that the extent to which universities rely on private donors has dramatically increased, and that that is, you know, that is widely admitted. Uh, uh, fair enough, but it, universities can't raise taxes. Only no, governments no. can do that. Yeah, yeah. If governments aren't prepared to do it, and universities need the money, can you blame them for well, going I'm, to rich people to get it? I'm not. I'm not blaming the universities, uh, although I would rather see them pressure put more pressure on government to increase their funding rather than I'm so sure they do. Yeah, they do. They, sure do. they do. But but I'm just saying like for instance they attack me for raising these points mm -hmm. rather than attacking the government for not paying them more. But but you you're right, of course. That that, it, it, that that they have been kind of put in the position where they are forced to rely increasingly. The, the real issue to me is that if it's better to do this through the tax system, let's do that. Let's put the pressure on government to properly fund our in our public institutions again. Sounds like the preponderance, well, I shouldn't say the preponderance, I said probably the largest chunk of people in this society don't necessarily want their taxes raised. Yeah, well, let's put it this way. If you, in fact, if you give people a choice, you know, do you want tax cuts or do you want social reinvestment in important things like health care and education? Yeah, what you find ladder. is dramatically they yeah. favor. So, so yes, of course, if you say, you know, uh, do you want a tax cut? Do you want some chocolate ice cream? Do you want some pizza? People say yes. But when you actually get down to questions about what their priorities are, you find that, in fact, people quite strongly favor the social reinvestment. Okay, the question here then becomes, what are these folks getting for the money that they're donating to these universities? Now, if you ask the universities, they'll say they're getting their name on a building and nothing more. Is okay, that true? Well, no, they get a lot more. But first of all, let's even point out that we're not getting as much money from them as it seems that we're getting. How so? Well, because there's a very generous tax deduction when you make a charitable contribution. So for instance, the example that I used, the Peter Monk donation of $35 million to U of T last year. For the Monk School. Yeah, for the Monk School of Global Affairs. Um, in fact, once the tax, once he gets the tax deduction, his actual donation isn't $35 million, it's $19 million. And in fact, if he makes his donation in publicly traded shares, and that's the way most of these things are done, his donation might be actually quite a bit smaller than even 19 million. Okay, I so, the, so, so we're, we're not getting as much money this way as we think we are. But I, th I think that's true if he donates it personally. But if he donates it from a foundation, I'm not sure the tax advantage is there, and well, therefore no, 35 all, million is really 35 no, million. No, 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 no. There's always don't. The, the whole point of setting up these foundations is to get special tax advantages. Because one of his representatives mm -hmm. told me that the 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 point that you allege that 35 million is really only half that because he gets a 50 percent tax write-off isn't true because he's not giving it personally. He's giving it foundationally. Yes, but the whole purpose of setting up the foundation is to get special tax benefits through that. I, I mean, if he wants to put out his, you know, his tax return and we can go over it, I'd be delighted. But, <laughs> but in fact, um, you know, there's no dispute that the tax benefits are very generous. And as I say, with the pu publicly traded shares, they're even more generous. Now, the mm -hmm. important point about that is that, um, you know, not only, you know, in the donation, let's say the Monk donation, in addition to his money, there was money put in by the federal and provincial government that yes. was sort of part of the package. That Janice Stein knows how to shake money out of the trees. <laughs> and, and so the result is it ends up something like 66 million of public money ended up going into this project of, compared to 19 million or less for Monk. Uh, and yet when it comes to naming the building, we don't name it after the Canadian taxpayers, we name it after Peter Monk. And in fact the ongoing costs are entirely borne by the university. So, uh, by the university and taxpayers. So his actual contribution is much smaller than it appears to be. That's okay, let's, let's say granted that. Having said that, it wouldn't have happened if he hadn't given the money. And therefore, well, and I'm, not, I'm not alleging this is his, his um, situation, yeah, yeah. but 
if he wants a little ego trip of having his name on the building yeah, or whoever yeah, it is. I'm not saying that but, about him. What's the but, big deal? But Steve, well, the, the point is uh, we need our universities funded. If we had adequate taxes on people like Peter Monk at the upper end, which we used to, we used to have much higher taxes in the early post-war years, if we maintained those taxes and stopped cutting them as we've done after 1980, we wouldn't have to rely on him okay, for that the, donation. To, to me, the financial argument is less problematic. The more interesting question okay. is, what, what are you buying academically? Yeah, I, 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 I they... kind of agree with you. I okay. think that what, in fact, I got a copy of the agreement between Monk and the university, and it's really quite revealing because the university insists that there's no, you know, they have full academic control, and they sort of say that. And, but in fact, within the agreement, it specifies certain things which actually give Monk a great deal of control. Control? Well, I'm not sure that's well, the right put, word. Let, let me, well, you can call it influence, but... but benchmarks. Let, He's put benchmarks okay. out there that they have to hit or else he can revoke his money. Yeah, but he, the, the major part of his money is only released by him after he is determined that he is satisfied with what the school has become and but what it's done. But he's not talking curriculum. He's talking position he, in the world. He's well, talking well, importance no, no, and status. Actually, the, what the agreement says is it'll be absolutely up to him to decide. And, you know, there'll be no appeal from it. Well, he can decide on any whim he wants. That, that, the way it's worded is just absolutely carte blanche. He can not make that final payment if it doesn't meet his satisfaction, and there will be no appeal. But then they take his name off the school, and he takes the yeah, adverse but, publicity well, with pulling look, his but, name off. But think about that. Does the university want to do that? Would the university want to do that and alienate him and all other donors in the future? No. What's going to happen instead is that the university will shape the school so that it will please him. But it's a partnership, isn't it? He, he, I mean, the University of Toronto is a pretty damn good school. Yeah, and he gets yeah. glory reflected on him yeah. by being associated with it, yeah. just as they're happy to take his money so that they can provide a better service to students. Well, uh, isn't that one hand well, washing well, the other? Well, again, I would rather have these things decided more democratically. For instance, he requires in the agreement that the school include space for the Canadian International Council which is actually a kind of right-leaning think tank on foreign affairs. I don't think that has any place in the university, that, that, that institution, that, that think tank. It gives it a great status to bring it in and have the moniker of the University of Toronto uh, uh, connected with it. You don't think we need a little balance to all the left-wing think tanks that are out there doing I, I foreign see. affairs? Well, you, would you please tell me <laughs> what those left-wing think tanks well, are? There's a, there's I a foreign certainly... policy consensus in this country that's pretty center left well you know what's interesting i Don't would say think? there's a That's foreign i would say thing. there's a foreign policy consensus that is center left and favors things like the un but that's not what the establishment favors that's not what the elite our defense establishment our military our government is trying to uh, trying to take us in a different direction okay we should uh, oh i should ask you how'd you get your hands on that agreement well i can't reveal my sources oh somebody leak it to you well, I, I got it through a reputable source. I can only say it was given to me by an academic at the university. Okay, so yeah. you're sure that's it? Oh, you, oh you no, got, no, it's real, real and, and they have not contested that that's okay. accurate. Let me talk about Tommy Douglas. Yeah. Because yeah. you touched on this idea in your book about naming the health studies program after Tommy Douglas. Somebody right, had the idea, right. and you know, he's the father of Medicare and so right. on. But that they decided in the end not to do it because they thought, what big business is going to give money to a program named after a socialist. Yeah, yeah. Well, what what happened was a group of professors uh, that worked in the uh, health, public health area, wa approached the university about getting the a, a health program named after Tommy Douglas. It seemed like a natural. Don't forget, he was chosen the most respected, the greatest Canadian. Greatest Canadian. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and the university basically wasn't interested. You know, they've got lots of buildings named after wealthy Canadians, but there was no room at the university for a building named after Tommy Douglas. And the reason was because there was no money behind it. And that just underlines the point that the enormous sway that I think uh, the wealthy get by making these donations. I mean, we can't even get a, a recognized public hero in this country to be commemorated on a university course, a, a university program, because there's not enough money behind it. Okay, We're, uh, when your piece was in the Star, you did an excerpt in the book, I guess, or a, a small op-ed Yeah, it was, a, it was an excerpt from the book. Uh, yeah. In the Toronto Star back in September. And then uh, David Palmer, the Vice President of Advancement at U of T, had this to say about that. 
Every donor agreement includes this clause in its preamble. Whereas, the parties affirm their mutual commitment to the university's statement of institutional purpose, which includes a commitment to foster an academic community in which the learning and scholarship of every member may flourish with vigilant protection for the rights of freedom of speech, academic freedom, and freedom of research. In addition, the article shows an utter disregard for the fact that philanthropy has been a cornerstone of public institutions across this country in their pursuit of excellence, innovation, and growth. The real beneficiaries are the students of the universities, the patients of hospitals, the visitors to cultural institutions, and ultimately our children, whose lives and opportunities are transformed as a result of the selfless generosity of others. Well, no doubt a university administrator who's trying to get tens of millions of dollars out of wealthy benefactors is going to flatter them as he does there. But is he wrong? I, I think he's, let's put it this way, when he says that, I mean his first point, okay, yeah, no, no, I've read it. His first point is that, you know, that the university maintains academic freedom. Yes, it is true. I said that in the agreement. They state that up front. But it's kind of a, a, a platitude. When you get into the actual details of the agreement, for instance, things like the director of the school will have to give a detailed written report every year to the Monk Board of Directors. Why is that? You if there's no it. interference in the direction of the school, and, it's, and then it's to be followed up with a meeting why, with why, the Monk Board of Directors? Why, 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 I don't have a position yeah, on this. Yeah, I'm just yeah, you know, asking yeah. questions here. Why, why would informing the people who gave, whether it's 19 or $35 million to this institution as to what we're doing with their money, what's wrong well, with but, that? But the, but the point is, if you, you, it's not just informing, then the director will have to come and answer questions to the board. Clearly, what, what the attempt there is, is to influence the shape and direction of, well, the, the, of, the, of the school. I, I would have thought it's to be accountable. In the same way that the, the director of the Monk School or the, oh. or the president of the university has to go to the premier or the minister of education and be accountable. But that's exactly the point. We don't want the university to be accountable to Peter Monk. Then that's like him buying some kind of control. What we want is funding through the tax system so that we, the people, through democratic governments, get to determine, get to set how our universities operate and what their priorities are. But there's we don't want a tiny group of very wealthy you. people but determining the, the... Because for one thing, don't forget this, Steve. Universities, the, one of the key role of our universities is to be centers of critical thought and debate and to challenge the, established, the, sta the status quo and the established order. Uh, well, how likely are they going to feel free to do that if more and more of their funding comes from that established well, I hear order. you, and, and that is something to be concerned about, but just, just as it is, there's a lot of sucking up going on here, right? Whether it's to wealthy philanthropists or whether it's to the Minister of Colleges and Universities, who also may say, as the, the sole sh uh, shareholder of all of these universities, you got to do it my way. You know what? I agree with you. There's all kinds of problems with government and democracy, but as I think it was Winston Churchill once said, it just happens to be the best system that we yeah. have compared to all the others. Except Monk's going to have a relationship with that university for potentially for decades. The Minister of Colleges and Universities yeah. is going to be here and gone in two years. You know, that, but, that's but, a revolving but, but, door. But the question is, do we want Monk to have that much influence over the shape of a very important school within the university, which by the way is kind of sucking money out from other parts of the university because there's sections in the agreement about how the university will have to do various things to, you know, to advance the brand of the, of, of the Monk Center and to uh, meet the, you know, to make it a certain, of a certain level. Well, what that does is that makes it the priority and money from other parts of the university, and there have been complaints, by the way, after that article, I got some very interesting uh, communications from professors who had felt that money was being drained from other parts of the university towards the, the, towards the monk school. So the, the question is, you know, how much influence, how much power, how much do, well, let do me we want it. those? <clears throat> let me broaden it. You've got Peter yeah. Monk at the University of Toronto. You've got the Ivy family at the University of Western Ontario. You've got Seymour Schulich at York University. These are all people yes. who have given a lot of money yes. to, in the, I guess in the case of Ivy and Schulich, to business schools in order to, they would say, uh, support the kind of learning and teaching that's going on yeah. at those places. Uh, I, you know, someone's going to have to tell, I guess, the people watching us right now, yeah. uh, why it's a terrible thing to have your name on a building, 
if it means giving some money to allow students to learn better, to hire more teachers, and, in or, and to be more world class, yes. which I think is what they want at the end of the day. Well, but just a second. When you say to have your name on the building, why do we necessarily want our public buildings to commemorate only rich people? You know, as I say, in the earlier days, we commemorated people for intellectual achievements at the university. Now... Okay, well, Osgoode Hall Law School is still named after Osgood. He's not a rich guy. He's an old guy. Yeah, He's an yeah, old white but, guy but from but a long time ago. But I'm just saying, th this trend is becoming more pronounced now. There's no question. Nobody disagrees with that. There are more buildings named after the, the rich. The fact that we can't even get a little Tommy Douglas building in there <laughs> somewhere, it, first of all, it just... It, it undermines our control over our own community and our, our ability to commemorate and honor the people we want. Okay, let me read something. Uh, Clifford Orwin, you saw his piece in the Global yeah, Mail? Yeah, yeah. He's another big fan. Uh, here's what he had to say. No one loves universities today. Not parents who complain of paying so much and not students who complain of getting so little. Not the underpaid and untenured journeymen who do so much of the teaching. And no, not even us senior tenured inmates who supposedly lead the life of Riley. Not the left, which lashes universities for their complicity and inequality and their subservience to business interests. And not the right, which berates them for their inefficiency, irrelevance, and stifling atmosphere of left-lib ideological conformity. Um, it sounds like it's piling on season on universities in some respects. Eh? Do you, do you well, not worry I mean, about that? First of all, the last thing I was trying to do was pile on universities. I mean, to me, this is part of a broader argument that we make in the book I mean, the book is The Trouble with Billionaires. The book is about how there's too much power in the hands of billionaires and how, what the impact that has on society. And, and one of the things we're looking at is the enormous uh, impact it has on undermining democracy. I mean, we look at all other kinds of impacts, too. Um, but, but so the point is not to attack universities. Universities are precious, and, and, and our argument is they need to be much better funded, and they need to be better funded in, the, in a way that where we have more democratic control over them. Gotcha. And, and, and the, you know, the point about the extent to which the university will cease to be a proper place of critical thought and, and, and a place where people will challenge the existing ideologies, I mean, if we well, lose that, yeah. we've lost a great deal. Well, when we, you No know, question that's harder to do in this day and age. There's and no there's, question about it. And as long as you have the, the people that run the established order funding the universities, you're going to have very, it's going to be more and more difficult for universities to play that role. In your travels, did you find any wealthy philanthropists who genuinely give lots of money, no strings attached? Because um, I can name you one yeah, if you can. I'm, I'm sure there are. I'm sure there are. And, and, and the point is not to suggest that philanthropists are bad people or anything like that. that, that that's not the point. Um, I mean, look at what we have in the States. You've got Buffett and Gates giving away half their fortunes or more. Uh, so the point is not to suggest that the, the wealthy are ungenerous. The, the point is to suggest that you know, a lot of their money is going to end up funding these institutions. But whether you do it through the tax system or whether you do it through them having private donations uh, and having much more control of it, it makes a huge difference I in what you. kind of society okay. you're going to Let me have. ask you one last thing. And that is, you know, the rich are going to spend their money at the end of the day on something. Wouldn't you prefer that they spent it on universities or hospitals rather than go out and buying yachts and private jets? Well, but Steve, you keep <laughs> avoiding my point that another, no, I'm not another way the point. they could spend I'm their money... We uh, may live in the real world. Yeah. And the real world, governments are not going to raise taxes as much as you want them to. The rich are going to spend their money in ways you won't like them to. So well, well, no, no, but if it's an option between yachts yeah, and universities, yeah. isn't that a better option? Well, yeah, I guess, but... but, but you know, you're, you're, you're eliminating the preferable option. And, and you say governments aren't going to do that. I mean, the whole argument that we're making and that we, we show how much income and wealth has gone straight to the top. In the past 30 years, we've seen an incredible concentration of income and wealth at the top. That's where all the money's gone. That's the logical place to tax. And so please don't dismiss so quickly the idea and in fact, there's lots of evidence that the public is quite supportive of these ideas. Uh, if you can get them out to them. If the public were supportive of them, presumably politicians would do them. Well, and po it would politicians happen. are often too scared to even advance them. Uh, I mean, there's just some interesting studies, for instance, even in the US, a very interesting study came out a couple of weeks ago at, from Harvard showing that, in fact, Americans, by overwhelming margin, when they were given a choice 
how they would want wealth distributed in the country, and it was a blind thing. They didn't know which chart represented which country. The one that uh, over 70% chose was Sweden. They actually liked the way that was distributed. Now, it wasn't identified as Sweden, or right. they would have thought that was very bad. Sure. But they liked that distribution of income. And Americans that was, did. Yeah. And in fact, if anything, it's, those trends are more true in Canada. Hmm. Linda, you're always provocative. We always love having you here. Uh, the Trouble with Billionaires is your latest, and thanks for coming into TVO tonight. My pleasure, Steve.